And all right, we're back with Bitcoin Stories. It's been it's been a little while um, since I've done an episode, a couple of weeks. But uh, today I've got Keegan and Murugaksi on my show. I'm going to be interviewing uh, the two of you about your Bitcoin story. So let's start there. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're doing well. Good. The AC is on. We're currently in India, and it's starting to get hot. So we're, we're about <laughs> cool right we're now. about in India. Are you guys? Uh, close to Mumbai, so Pune. Okay. Okay. And yeah. then what's the temperature there right now? How hot is Some it? Some days it's 40, <laughs> which yeah, is um, 30, oh, far beyond <laughs> my threshold of comfort. But um, 40 like we is hot. Said, we're, we're, uh, we're weathering the storm. In, in, uh, we're, it's not a storm. It's just heat. Yeah. We're actually going to be... Yeah. We're going to be in Mumbai this this Saturday for a Bitcoin meetup. Um, mm. And like we, Keegan has not experienced Mumbai humidity and heat. Uh, and it's not even summer. It's just March. So all in the name of Bitcoin, you just got to love it, <laughs> love it, embrace it. it, it it's so, so, okay, so let's, I guess, let's get into it. I mean, we recently met through, I guess it was through this Bitcoin meetup, right? That uh, the well, Indian... it was actually Brad. Brad, it was Brad, Brad that connected us, right. Yeah. Brad Mills. Good yes, man. Yes, Brad Mills. Hi, Brad. Known Shout for a out long to time. Brad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great guy. Follow yes. him everywhere. Yeah, so it was Brad that had connected us, but wasn't it regarding this meetup or was it something, some other topic? I think he was, mm. no? No. Well, he knew that we had a podcast and, <clears> and we do. It's called Go Full Crypto. And um, sometimes he just tweets um, at us and tagging Go Full Crypto or puts us in an cool. email with somebody else saying that, hey, you guys should interview this person because this person has an awesome story. So mm. you should get him on your show. And that's exactly what he did with uh, you and us because uh, he connected us last year, but we'd started traveling uh, around that time. So um, I responded to that email thread saying, oh, that's awesome. Uh, we'll connect in the new year because we're currently traveling. It'll just be very hard to um, schedule something in. And then coincidentally, we were also, mm. I don't remember how, but involved in the, the Bitcoin conference group in which you were in as well. So that's ah, how we so started. Like two different ways. Interesting. Okay. So yeah. I thought I had muddled those two things in my brain, but so, so awesome. So here we are. And I, and maybe what I'll do is I'll put a link to, you know, the interview you guys did uh, of me on your Thank show you, yeah. as well, yeah. in case people want to watch it. But today is the reciprocal of that, right? It's the opposite. So we're going to talk about you guys. I'm really pumped about it. And just hearing about your story like how'd you guys end up in india you know how is it that you're in the bitcoin crypto scene um hopefully we'll talk about bitcoin maximalism a little bit and <laughs> how awesome it is <laughs> um but also you know like kind of the other side of it and let's let's get into it so where do you guys want to start uh actually let's start with keegan mining dogecoin <laughs> <laughs> let's do it yeah well yeah okay so that is where I got my start, embarrassingly enough, but um, I like my roots and I'm comfortable with them because they eventually put me on the Bitcoin path, mm. um, the straight and narrow arrow, uh, as some might call it. This is back in 2015 too. 2013. So oh. yeah, I got into Dogecoin kind of early and eventually sold my holdings um, for Bitcoin. And, you know, that was, that was fine. But it was, um, it was, I thought I was too late when I was mining Dogecoin. I thought I was too late to Bitcoin. Bitcoin was like 50 bucks at the time. Um, common sentiment, right? Um, I didn't end up getting into Bitcoin, actually like buying it until 2015. And uh, I like to say that I came for the gains, but stayed for the philosophy. And I did my, uh, my fair share of shit coining in 2017 as well, um, which I still do now. Uh, like I'll actually <laughs> show up Brad again. He gave us a, a phrase for this uh, he says that he's a bitcoiner in the streets and a shit coiner in the sheets which i just thought is a hilarious so way to put it funny so funny yeah. i can see brad saying that too yeah okay <laughs> so i mean so this is actually around the time that rugakshi and i met in 2017 mm. um i i'd been working for a fintech company um just like a regular fiat fintech company not anything interesting and uh, bitcoin related but um i, I left that job to, to, to do blockchain uh, to do a blockchain job. It was a provably fair gaming and gambling uh, blockchain. It was like a purpose built blockchain for sports betting and gambling. And it was, I thought it was really interesting. They were trying to solve the Oracle problem. And uh, we did a really good job with that, but uh, had zero traction. The marketing department was, uh, was not sufficient for, for making this thing uh, take off. We were trying a Bitcoin side chain. We were trying lots of things. But this eventually just set us up really good to um, left that job and, and started the company. Um, so our company's called Atlantic Blockchain Company. 
our podcast is called Go Full Crypto, and we do the majority of our education around Bitcoin. So we're trying to cover all bases here and appeal to all audiences and um, kind of gather the Bitcoin folk, gather the crypto folk, and then try to funnel them into the Bitcoin rabbit hole, because ultimately that's where we see the most, uh, the most purpose and, and value. Um, I mean, that's my story in a nutshell. Let's let's um, kind of weave I'm gonna, reduction I'm gonna into the story. I'm going to backtrack, though, because yeah, like the whole GoFull crypto thing is uh, it can be interpreted based on who, whatever experience someone has had. Right. But for us, when we decided the name of our show, it was essentially because we were like, you know, fuck the traditional finance uh, <laughs> banking system and uh, is it okay to swear on this show by the way oh yeah absolutely okay <laughs> okay it's encouraged cool. no, i'm kidding we were we were extremely frustrated and we'd had enough um mm. interactions with banks that we were like oh my god how can we just opt out what can we do to opt out and at this point we were sold on bitcoin um but in canada in this is what in 20 19 2020 we were, we were sold on bitcoin as money we were sold on bitcoin as money but we we didn't have the tools to be able to operate our daily life in mm-hmm. in bitcoin or even in crypto so go full crypto was just us opting out of traditional finance and opting into what the cryptocurrency world has to offer uh, and that's how we started that but my entry into just this entire world was in 2017 uh, when the the bull market was on and then when it popped but mostly when it was on because keegan and i were dating at the time and uh we're married now we're married now by the way uh and he and he would just (laughs) call me at random times in the evenings um and just freak out and he would freak out because Mm -hmm. the price of every asset that he owned was up like 20 percent or 25 percent. i was a pro trader in 2017 by the way (laughs) And then he would call me at other times freaking out because it was down 5% or 10%. I just, um, I didn't know what he was talking about then, but I wanted in on that excitement. And <laughs> that, and, and like, I don't always thought that, oh, I probably should invest in something, but I just didn't know how or didn't feel the need to do it or didn't have enough of a trigger point. So it was actually Keegan's excitement that, um, that I was that I wanted for myself, which is why after the bubble popped in 2018, that's when I wanted to buy Bitcoin. And it wasn't really easy to find a place for me to buy Bitcoin when I wanted. And I was feeling FOMO at that time. I remember I remember because we exhausted all of the options online. There was no Bitcoin ADMs in um, in Halifax that we knew of at the time. Also, there's so, like a 12% markup on Bitcoin. ATMs yeah, that's and- 16, 12 to 20% actually. So I actually, I, I bought Bitcoin off of Keegan. He sold me my first thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> Where did you get it from? It, there, there, weren't there websites and stuff at the time? Or was it just, I guess you guys. Well, okay. So Quadrigo actually was. Oh, was still Quadriga. around. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. yeah I right. remember that. I, story. So I used Quadrigo when I was working at this blockchain company, I was getting mm. paid in Bitcoin. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the ways I was, um, I was getting Bitcoin and, but, but like Quadrigo was actually a really awesome and reliable service um, <laughs> until it wasn't, <laughs> until it wasn't exactly, yeah. unbeknownst to me, it was a Ponzi scheme and I stopped using it because my paycheck started to take a long time for me to convert into Canadian dollars and then get those Canadian dollars into my regular bank account to pay expenses. And I just remember like, okay, it took three days. Oh, it took seven days. It took Mm. 16 days. It took 25 days. And then that particular transfer, um, like 25 days later, it was, um, it was from his wife. It was a company that she operated. I was like, "Mm, red flag. And so I moved all my money off and I lost exactly $0 from Quadriga, which was (laughs) um, one of my finer moments, I suppose. Um, But yeah, I mean, that's how I accumulated some bitcoin during that interesting time. what was yeah. it about dogecoin i'm just curious that that you know caught your interest i mean look i mean i i mean it's what elon musk is talking about it now right <laughs> so i mean laugh at it if you will but it's uh it's definitely caught you know elon's interest and then and, and i love his point what's his point that he makes is that it's what is this? it's I the forget. most unlikely outcome there it, you go it, it's like the the most memeable or if like funny outcome the most ironic outcome right uh mm. like he so he quotes Occam's razor, which is uh, like the most simplest outcome is the most likely solution. Um, and he's, let's just call it Elon's razor rather than uh, Occam's razor. Okay. And he says that the, the most ironic uh, thing is, is the most likely outcome. Uh, and so like Dogecoin, I was, I was asked to compare, you know, that matrix of like the six properties of money. 
um where yeah yeah like, yeah uh, of course yeah yeah, yeah. okay um durability and, scarcity fungibility like that one right mm -hmm. i was to asked to compare some coins and build a matrix out of like the top 10 coins and dogecoin was on there and like after i like sat and thought about each coin uh like dogecoin appeared higher on the list than something like ethereum for me uh like just though this is my subjective rating of them all uh but it i just thought it was yeah dogecoin Let's, was I'm bitcoin on that list questions. just curious oh yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and and it was yeah. even more so than bitcoin no 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 oh. it um uh, like the decentralization factor is, is, is quite low right and right. um but like a lot of people don't know this but like ten thousand dogecoin get mined every block right uh and like that's a number that never changes so it's a constant uh new supply of dogecoin every one minute right one minute block times but relative to existing supply the inflation rate goes down it it never hits zero but it approaches zero right so relative to new supply it's, it's got a decreasing inflation rate and that's like one of the reasons why i rated it higher on like a hardness level as far as hard money goes it becomes harder money over time the more time it's active the harder it is relative to existing supply so i, I just thought that was an interesting anecdote but again uh mm. answering your questions taking mm. a step back what got me interested in dogecoin was yeah. just someone offered me an opportunity um to uh to build um help build a website for their mining operation and this was actually a ponzi scheme i found out later because the guy closed up shop and just took people's money he was paying out dogecoin based on profits of uh, that people invested uh which sucked i didn't know i was participating in a ponzi scheme but uh, you get your start somewhere apparently and and what about yourself? So you said you got you saw his kind of excitement about all the trading he was doing and you wanted in. And was it was it Doge that you came in on as well? Or was he kind no. of further down? No, no. Yeah. Like I think that you were um you were not shit coining shit coining as much at the end of 2017. It was actually Bitcoin that sort of rose uh to the top. And you know, the cream always rises, and that was Bitcoin at this point. So I was not interested in other um, coins. I was only interested in Bitcoin for some reason. I don't actually remember, but I think maybe part of it was, I don't want to spend time and effort researching these other coins. I'm just going to go all in on Bitcoin. Um, and then I did sort of digress and look into some other tokens, but that was very short lived because I, I bought them and I, I just felt like I didn't, I didn't want to spend time with them at all. So I sold them for Bitcoin and I was like, okay, this is, I'm going to buy, I'm going to hold um, cause that is less stress and, um, it is just really easy to just buy an investment and then forget about it and then keep buying. And actually buying Bitcoin became very addictive, uh, not early on, but in the past six months, oh my God. So we converted all of our money into Bitcoin in 27, 2020. Um, right before, um, right when actually MicroStrategy and Teeny's Restaurant in Ontario was doing it. Uh, so we converted our personal savings into Bitcoin and our business cash reserves into Bitcoin. And then, uh, you know, based on when we would have contracts for our content writing, content production business, we, if we would get um, paid in fiat, we would co convert it into Bitcoin. So for the longest time, we never really had um income in the sense where we'd have just extra money to put into Bitcoin because all of our money was already in Bitcoin. But the past six months, because we've been traveling, uh, we still, I, I get paid in Canadian dollar because I pay the rent um, through my bank account and that we can't really switch to anything else. So I just had uh, you know, an extra two, two grand in my bank account every single month. I was like, oh my gosh, I can buy Bitcoin with this. Um, so every single week, uh, just looking at the market, every time Bitcoin is in a red market, I buy $200 and that's a lot of fun. I get a lot of satisfaction from it. That's a dopamine hit. <laughs> I forget. I think I forget what which company it was, but I, I saw that they recently activated this like feature where every time I think it was Peter Schiff. Um, Peter Schiff tweets about something negative about Bitcoin and buys like X amount of Bitcoin. That's the Amber like, app in Australia. That's Alex Amber Spetsky app. That's app. the what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the gentleman behind that? I, 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 I've been, Alex I haven't had him. Yeah, Alex. I had him on the show actually. You I get him on the show. I, I think I interviewed him actually. It was, it was a couple. Yeah, maybe about fifteen or twenty episodes ago. But uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um. Okay. So what was it that got you guys like? So I'm really curious because I got into time and at a time when Bitcoin was like the only show in town. There was nothing else. Right. I think Litecoin was probably just there, and and so it was really easy for me to like 
get go all in on Bitcoin because that's all there was. It was like the rest of the world and Bitcoin. And then as everything else started coming at me like a ninja, I could kind of like quickly like call it out because be like, what? Say what? It's not deflationary. It's what? Disinflationary? That doesn't sound like deflationary. There's a couple of words, <laughs> letters in there. Okay, fast, next one. And I could quickly go through and figure out what was real and what wasn't. But I always find it fascinating for people on the other side of the fence is like when you come in when there's so much noise out there, how do you settle on Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is a pretty strong signal. So like Bitcoin mm. has, deserves a lot of credit for just being a, a consistently strong, well, signal. Um, like a lot of credit needs to go to the Bitcoin maxis on this, right? Uh, because they amplify that signal uh, and do nothing else but amplify it, right? Uh, whereas like people like us, Rigakshi and I, we, we kind of try to take other people's signal and then integrate it into Bitcoin. Like we want to amplify the Bitcoin signal at the end of the day. Um, I, yeah. I think it was money because we truly started looking at and seeing Bitcoin as money um, in 2020. And uh, that is largely attributed to us, one, having not very good experiences at the bank. And then also to learning about money in general, because, you know, once you have an experience at the bank where they're like, oh, no, like, we're not going to initiate that transfer for you. And then you ask yourself or you ask them, wait, what do you mean you're not going to allow me to send my money where I want to send it? Mm. And what do you mean I, you're like, not going to give me a bank account because yeah, my yeah. company's named Atlantic Blockchain Company? Yeah, yeah. What do you mean you're just, they showed us the door. Like they, when one of the people that we were talking to when we wanted to set up a bank account for our company back in 2018, uh, the person said, oh, I'm just going to go talk to my manager. And then the same person came out, the manager did. And then they're like, yeah, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave. We can't help you. They were, they were very politely, uh, pol they very politely showed us the door, but they still showed us the door. And we were like, wait, you're not going to give us an account because our company's name Atlantic Blockchain company and we had no business at that time this was a very very new company yeah, we're in the first we were week. already rejected yeah also not being able to get a mortgage because we just started a business and you, even if we had like proof of funds and etc cetera, etc cetera. and all i think all of those um in tandem to you know learning about what bitcoin is and what other cryptocurrencies do they helped me question how much control i truly even have on my money when it's in the bank. And thanks to those experiences, I'm really grateful for them. They propelled me even more into having a distaste for leaving my money in the bank. And then if you don't leave your money in the bank, where else do you leave your money? And then if you dis distrust that the money that you have in your bank, mm. you don't really have ownership over, well, what's the alternative? And Bitcoin always was the answer. Because anything else was not something that fit all of the properties of money. And that is why, at least for, for me, and I think for you too, Keegan, that's why Bitcoin always rose to the top. Yeah. But, but maybe we might want to go into that matrix, right, that you brought up earlier, because I'm curious to, to dig a bit deeper, right? Because, I mean, if I'm coming at it from, like, the average Joe, I would hate to be named Joe, by the way, because you'd always get pumped into this, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, is if you're like the average, you'd probably think of, like, money banks banks are really big governments they have lots of guns really strong that's money right um what some alphanumeric you know private key public key cre cryptography anonymous sorry stop on the, the next right well they don't want to they just like, are you crazy you're nuts so you almost have to be able to, as Elon Musk says, right? You have to be able to build up these arguments from first principles, right? So what are those first principles? What what made you land on Bitcoin as like the money? So neither one of us are economists mm. or or bankers. We're we're actually we both graduated from Canadian University with our computer science degrees. Hmm. So it was what, like what you just said, learning this stuff from print, first principles was the route for us to take to understand Bitcoin as the optimal form of money that the world has to offer. Um, like Rigakshi said, we had all of these negative experiences that ultimately resulted us in experiencing financial pain. And so when we experience that financial pain, we look for the exact opposite of what that system was giving us. The system that was giving us pain, what's the exact opposite of that? And or what's the alternative, if not even the opposite? Right. It's like, okay, if we don't own our money in the bank, then okay, where what can I find where I can own my money? Um, and then Bitcoin was the answer. As, as far as first principles go, the six properties of money, uh, I learned this from Breedlove, Robert Breedlove, um, and th that's durability, divisibility, portability, uniformity, or fungibility, depending on uh, 
what you call it, acceptability and limited supply. And as far as I can tell, the only one that Bitcoin hasn't optimized yet is acceptability. And that's only because not enough time has elapsed, but everything else, it's, it's, it's more or less completely optimized. Um, there's an argument around uniformity and fungibility with uh, the UTXO model um, of, of Bitcoin um, altering its fungibility and the account model of Ethereum being more fungible and yada, yada, yada. But, but it's also the ability to um, have the UTXOs that you receive being blocked or censored because they were once owned by someone whose address has been flagged. And now we have blockchain forensic tools that can look at those UTXOs and, and just kind of blacklist them. Yeah, or label them as tainted or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's, yeah. That's a really interesting um, argument as well. Uh, like it's an interesting discussion to get into because I think that's also where we're headed. Like it, if, if we're headed towards more adoption of Bitcoin or more acceptability, let's say, then um, we're going to have more surveillance on the whole network as well. Like the NSA is going to build surveillance and coin tracking tools. They're going to have blacklists. They're going to distribute these blacklists. I could see a day where like self-custody wallets, for example, are um, banned. Like no, you can't ban Bitcoin. So what, what else can you do? Well, let's ban a, a massive number of, let's actually only whitelist exchange addresses. Exchanges will have to publish their X pubs and you can only send Bitcoin to and from these exchanges. So, I mean, Bitcoin that are off of exchanges would then be traded or uh, transferred at a premium, for example. I hope that takes, I feel like well, if that happens, Keegan, that's going to take a really long time because uh, lawmakers and regulators still don't understand Bitcoin. Right. And that was made very evident by the Freedom Convoy because of that uh, email they sent to, what was Nunchuck. it? Nunchuck. Yeah, the self-custodial wallet service. Um, and the, I mean, the fact that they even thought that they could email Nunchuck and say, hey, disclose the accounts of all these people was them not knowing that they can't actually do that because it's not possible. It was very telling um, of their state of knowledge. So if this happens in the next five years or 10 years, I'm hoping that there'll be even more adoption because like the state of the world right now is con consistently going towards a state of like being shittier, I would say. <laughs> um, and then there's more restrictions and there's just so many more things happening that are making life difficult for more individuals and when your life becomes difficult you look for solutions because our primal instinct is to survive and if those restrictions are put on money they're going to look for ways that they can have money where they're not they're not restricted in any way shape or form and they are going to find answers to that problem and all of that boosts acceptability at the end of the day demand increases acceptability Sorry, lots in there, but one, one point I wanted to make was around privacy is I think kind of the core, one of the core points you're making, right? Meaning I think like the fact that Bitcoin is this public ledger and it lacks true privacy and, you know, and there are companies like Chainalysis and, and such that their, their life mission is to essentially, you know, demystify the blockchain for, for law enforcement, et cetera. Um, is is really it comes down to a question of like privacy and i think that the, the 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 thing is is most people jump to this conclusion that if you want to be private you're doing something bad but privacy is like a core requirement that like i think money and humans have right and businesses have it's like you just don't want the world to know and if a bad guy forget the government or tax it was a bad guy or anybody or your competitor or whatever right so um, and so Bitcoin, from that perspective, should be iterating. It is open source, after all. From what I hear, Lightning is a lot more um, private. And, you know, and, and I'm sure, and again, I don't know a lot about, like, the Schnorr signature and all these, like, crazy, awesome things that, that, uh, that, that, that you know, people are kind of working on, right, to make Bitcoin more. You know, there was a, there was a recent thing um, in, in Europe, right, just yesterday or two days ago yeah. that come about CoinJoin and Samurai Wallet. Did you guys, have you guys been following that thread? Wasabi Wallet. Yeah, I, I wasn't following mm. it too closely, but I saw some people that I follow a tweet about it and then mm. I just uh I was curious to see what that was all about so I think I think in order for them to comply with uh, I don't know what sort of regulation they needed to um declare something 
from wh whoever was on the Wasabi wallet to this authority. And then that's why they decided that, that they were going to fork the, the wallet into two different wallets. So then the, the one that we originally know as the Wasabi wallet would be the one that declares let's just say transactions to this other third authority, but then the fork, the hard fork is going to be the, the private uh, or privacy enforcing wallet, something like that. Don't take my word for it, but that was the gist of it. Yeah. Anyway, so very, yeah. And then you, you brought up the, the trucker convoy. That's obviously something that's very, you know, close to home and, and again, demonstrated that because you made this point earlier, right. Which is that that, that your money isn't your money, right? What did you mean by that? Like, I, I don't think a lot of people get that. Like, you guys are computer scientists, right? So you said that, I think, right? So that's awesome. So you can maybe break it down a bit more. Like, what do you mean? I have an app, you know, I, on my bank. It just shows the money's there. It's literally there. I can see the digits. So what do you mean it's not there? You are crazy. Uh, Bitcoin it's is the same owned. thing. So what do you mean by that? <laughs> it's all owed. We don't own money. It's an IOU. It's an IOU by the authority that stamps that currency and says, oh, by the way, this $1 bill that you have, we're just letting you know that it's $1, but it actually is not backed by anything. It just means that because we said so, it is. And that's what like that's what I mean by our money is not our money. When I have money in the bank account, it's not mine on two accounts or two tiers. One, because the bank owns it and the bank does whatever they want with it. Because when I check that terms and conditions, I check that they have the ability to use my money and make more money because what are you going to do when you have so much capital just sitting around? And then the second tier of that is that's a, a, like a second layer of, oh, you know, like you, it's still not my money, even if it's the bank, even if I have earned it, the value that and the purchasing power that I get with the money that I have decreases mm -hmm. over time. That's not something that I have control over. That is not something that I can impact either. That just happens in the background. And I'm just supposed to be okay with it and go along with it and, you know, not have the ability to do anything to stop it. So that's the second layer of me not being able to own my money. Because if I have ownership over something, I should have the ability to control it and to do what I want with it in that sense. Like I own this bottle, right? Like this is mine. I can drink from it. I can fill it up whenever I want. If I drop it, that's on me. But with respect to our money, I can't do that. It's just something that is given to us. And we are made to believe that we own it when we truly, really, truly don't. And with the whole privacy thing that you brought up too, um, if you have nothing to hide, then how does that saying go? If you have nothing to hide... You, then you should, like basically should feel okay with being surveilled. Yeah, well, That's the nothing that to that should that is just uh, I don't know if propaganda is the right word to say for it, but that is such a manipulative sentence. Sentence because banks have the largest silos for information, and um, Bitcoin's privacy is different than the privacy that you get with bank accounts. But you have zero privacy. Even again, going back to the Freedom Convoy, we saw that. Right. Like if people donated to um, the, the Freedom Convoy, their bank accounts were frozen. Does that mean you have privacy with with it? And like, again, if you have nothing to hide, sure, you didn't have you didn't want to hide that you supported the Freedom Convoy. But the consequence of that is that, again, you don't have control over your money. And just because you think that this is something you shouldn't hide. People can see it and then take different action on it, which is why privacy is so important. I heard that the only money that actually got through was Bitcoin, was the Bitcoin funds. I heard that was the only money that actually made its way to the to the truckers. I don't maybe not all of it, or I don't know, maybe some of it got frozen yeah, or I something. Can, I don't know what the details are. You, you got some goods on that? I got something. So Vice, <laughs> okay. I, I used to have a lot of respect for Vice, um, and mm. but like the journal, the quality of journalism at Vice has gone down so much in the years. Uh, there was just one clickbaity article that's been circulating the last couple of days, and it says. Um, mm. Uh, the, the Bitcoin that was donated to the Freedom Convoy has now been frozen and seized. And so I've been like kind of making it uh, like a small mission of mine on Facebook and Twitter and my communities to be like, okay, look, it can't be frozen. Can it be seized? Yes, it can be seized. But like the article headline at least made it made people believe that uh, like all of it was frozen as if that's some power that exists with respect to Bitcoin and it doesn't. And then they made it believe that all of all of the 16.2 Bitcoin was uh, was seized. And then I read the article and it was like 0.26 of it was seized. Right. And they're just <laughs> trying to like 
propagate the narrative that Bitcoin is something that can be controlled, which mm. I think is a really irresponsible thing because like we need to teach people that this thing can't be controlled. Like our whole shtick right now is with, with, with regards to the politicization of Bitcoin, like in relation to Russia and Ukraine and then the mm. trucker convoy. Like I That's, think there's yeah. a real risk mm. of putting Bitcoin on either side of the political spectrum where like it actually either doesn't belong on the political spectrum at all or sits dead in the center of it. Um, Because if we, as soon as we politicize it and associate, oh, Bitcoin's right wing, it's like, okay, look, you just pissed off 50% of the entire population. Like, is that really a good thing to do um, with respect to like the labels that we put on Bitcoin? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the beauty of it. Bitcoin just is. (laughs) It just is. It's Um, like air. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess, okay, so very fascinating. So where else do you guys want to go with this in terms of, I don't know, just your Bitcoin story? I don't know, where where are you guys now? I mean, you, you alluded to your, your podcast. And, and by the way, just like my two cents on like the crypto thing. Look, I, I'm a Bitcoiner at heart. But over the years, there's been a word that's kind of like represented our industry and it's changes. It changes every yeah. couple of years. It used to be blockchain, uh, DLT, something, something, you know, it's like it's crypto is the new one, right? Crypto, it's like crypto, uh, but but it, it kind of shifts, right? But but I th- like to me, it's all about like meeting people where they're at. You know what I mean? Yes. Like if I'm just always like Bitcoin, 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 then people are going to be like tired of Bitcoin, it man. and they just don't want to hear, at least from my experience. And so it's better to like meet them. It's like, well, where are you at? Oh, you like Doge? Well, tell me about why you love Doge, right? And then be like, <laughs> oh, Bitcoin has some of those. And, you know, and kind of like bring them along. Or if they're, I remember at one time, my goodness, we were calling our events FinTech Canada. <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Because one of my goals was I wanted to have, I wanted to have, I live in a city called Toronto, right? There's lots of banks here. I wanted all the banks, bankers to show up at my event. And then I, and then I wanted to teach them, teach them, we'll use that word about Bitcoin. <laughs> that yeah. was my goal. But how am I going to get them to come to a, to a room if, as you mentioned, Bitcoin is like the most toxic word in the universe? Well, yeah, call yeah. it a fintech conference. <laughs> That's how you do you it. Talk about Bitcoin. And they yeah. all love fintech. And then there's obviously some fintech in and Bitcoin is fintech, if you ask me. Yes, it is. Right. Yeah, and then and then guess what? They get to write it off from their their uh, bank you know, whatever uh, expenditure monthly things. And it's like, it's a, they show up in droves. There's like 30 of them sitting front row from this bank. And, you know, and, and so it's like, it works, right? And the goal is to like get everyone together and, you know, teach about Bitcoin. And I kind of see the same thing in, in our company as well. It's like, if people want crypto, they want crypto. I mean, I'm not a fan of it. I go every day and try and tell people how Bitcoin's the one, but if they want it, you know, they want it, right? So might as well give it to them. So anyway, so that's kind of my thinking around it. And, uh, but I like Brad's, you know phrase a lot better <laughs> yeah. yeah our our philosophy on this is, is kind of more so towards around freedom and just giving people mm. acknowledging people's freedom to to make their own choices mm. um and then like i respect your choice to choose dogecoin i don't think it's a good choice mm-hmm. uh, like i can <laughs> I can sit here and critique it. I can maybe Mm. point out why you're wrong. I'm happy for you to point out why I'm wrong about Bitcoin. Um, But like, I, I won't, um, what's the word pejoratize or uh, like slander. I I don't like doing that. Just, it doesn't make me feel good to make others feel bad about Mm. their choices. Right. Like, I think it comes down to that and, and just respect for people's decisions. Like you said, meeting them where they're at, whatever their path was, that's where they are now. Mm-hmm. And all I can really do is, is tell them where I came from. And that maybe also, there's some overlap. That also doesn't change um, the way that we want to see the future change, right? Like someone says, this is your money and then you're just given it. But if someone decides that, hey, this is the investment that I want to make or this is what I find valuable, I, I feel like at least I personally don't have any right to tell them, no, you don't actually, that is not valuable and you should mm. not invest in that. Because, uh, you know, why do I know for, for them if it's their money at the end of the day and I have no responsibility whatsoever um, to show them a different way of doing things. Um, and the, Yeah, the, the, and then like another point is just, I think that we're all aligned in where we want to go with this um to, that's true to us this is kind of what go full crypto go full crypto is about opting out of the traditional world of finance the sooner we can do that the sooner we can kind of migrate away from this already crumbling machine 
the the better the better we can all be like if we want to first get anyone everyone into crypto and then bitcoin great that's a fine stepping stone like if you get into bitcoin through nfts fantastic i don't really care how you got here let's just go to the same place which is building a better financial world for everyone Right, right. Yeah. And then on the flip side, you know, when when I speak with Bitcoiners, like they're the ones I like kind of, uh, I don't know, I love the most, right? Like they're the ones that yeah. I like hanging out with. They're the ones that I think are kind of the smartest ones in the room, usually like uh, in every way, maybe not EQ as much, but IQ for sure. Um, but yeah, it's 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 like the, you can tell, like it just it's just like night and day. It's just night and day. And so I like, I appreciate the fact that they're building, you know, the future of money. And to me, that is one half of every transaction therefore yes. critically important so whenever you bring the concept of like oh well we're trying to you know build finance 2.0 web 3. Point, whatever it's like dude they're trying to build money like just let them focus yeah. <laughs> just shut up already you know <laughs> i think no, it's because but... bitcoin has so much philosophical depth oh, you know what i mean it Jeez. doesn't actually what it, does it doesn't it? Hmm. I don't think it does. So, all right, I'd love to dash this one out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, well, Bitcoin is something that we have given meaning to, right? Like the white paper is um, is a well, a kind Bible. of a, te- a technical paper of sorts that shows people what Bitcoin is for, what it's supposed to do, and then the code base we can all look into it and see how it is designed. But nowhere in there does it say that this is what Bitcoin can be for you. It can be a hedge against inflation. It can give you your freedom back. This is self sovereign money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like nowhere does it say that. This is all implied through the people that look at bitcoin because what about the chancellor reference in this in the genesis block again i like you know i think it can be interpreted in so many ways that to me that was like a fuck you this is bitcoin this is better and i'm just going to opt out of the the traditional finance system so that Mm. was like the first moment of um of bitcoin being like this is your second option if you want to opt out of banking right now if you want to opt out of giving money to these people who are just going to take it and then ruin it for you and then be okay at the end of the day bitcoin is your solution um but with the philosophical aspect i just mean like i don't i don't mean that bitcoin i cannot find philosophy in bitcoin because there's a lot associated with it but what i mean by bitcoin isn't philosophical is that it's not intrinsically um you know a, like a, a philosophy um it's something that we have made philosophical mm. which which again is awesome because if you can look at something give look at the solutions that it gives you and then find philosophy in it then that's fantastic yeah that, that's super deep because usually when people say this 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 the two opposite things is the same as it's really hard to counter i'm kidding <laughs> but yeah but keegan you take it over buddy <laughs> i got nothing <laughs> oh I, so yeah, I, I like what Mar- Marga always adds a lot of nuance to the discussion, actually. And uh, like from her perspective, she would like I'm I'm gonna paraphrase you and say say like Bitcoin's this this neutral thing, like no depth, and we've added so much depth to it or built mm. a lot of depth around it. Um, that's basically what I heard you say. And and I like I I love the, the philosophical depth that has taken place, especially in like the last four or five years, just like the, the implications that are possible to to happen. Um, because of Bitcoin's existence. And I just don't see that in other coins. You know what I mean? Like when I'm researching other projects and I try to forecast that 20 years in the road, it's like, okay, it's still the same DeFi system that like, I just don't see it having as much of an impact on the rest of society. Like money is completely central to the way that everyone um, lives. I I, I don't know. I I wrote in my newsletter the other day that it's like, Mm -hmm. it's more central than food, money, shelter, water, sorry, not money. It's more central than food, water, shelter, et cetera, because it is the medium through which we access all those things. Um, and mm-hmm. Ruga pushed back on me <laughs> in the newsletter. She edits all of mine, but uh, all of them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I pushed back on that too, because you were like, it's more central than food, water. You added some other things, but I was like, more central than food, water, and shelter? I'm yeah. not sure, because even if you don't have Bitcoin, right? If, or if you want to survive, you're going to need food, water, and shelter. So I don't see how Bitcoin is more central to your life than uh, procuring food water so and shelter i said money money is more central and like that's yeah and that's a big one po- is money yeah but i wouldn't say bitcoin's more central i would say money's more central um mm. because like it is the look if i'm not a farmer 
then mm. food food's not central to me um it's not the thing at the center of my universe my my kind of my skills how i've had my time mm. my time is actually more central than my money um and how i because i can use my time to earn money and i can use my money to earn food but if i'm not a farmer i can't use my time to earn food i think you're talking about this in, in a very different reality because when i read that <laughs> no no no. because when i read that i was like okay central um is this because in my edit as well i said are you just challenging the basic necessities and oh man every when i was writing that too i was like oh, these are the bare necessities <laughs> uh but anyway i digress um in the sense that you know how can i like i still don't believe that money can be more central to you than the 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 needs that you have in order to survive as a species and um, i think like i was is, talking about like yeah. you know if you have nothing what is the first thing you're gonna want to go get right and yeah. it's not gonna be bitcoin it's gonna be either food water or shelter based on what you're deprived of yeah if realistically yeah. speaking though like if i had nothing i wouldn't i actually like because i mean he's kind of right as in like to chase down a cow versus sell my services I might like in the day and age we live today, it might be easier to sell my services. Yeah. Cause like in me the- wrestling a cow, I took MMA for a few years, like martial arts, but I, <laughs> I think it would, it would kick the living shit out of me. <laughs> no, anyway, but I, I, you know what? It's one of those things where both of you are right. And I see both of your points. It's, I agree. It's, yeah. not about, it's not about right or wrong. It's actually mm. just about understanding because mm. when, yeah, but like the way that I'm interpreting what he wrote was yeah. okay. If you have nothing, right. Like, you know, even if you have skills that they're just not useful, right now or you've lost your home you've been evicted or whatever and you have no money left you're not going to go seek big seek bitcoin you're going to seek shelter um but that's the reality right. that i had in yeah mind i see what you mean you're gonna I go to your mom's house or someone or whatever first get the shelter but then you're gonna need your own yeah. shelter and you're gonna need to turn the money so it's kind of exactly. like yeah chicken and or egg you, type you, of thing i get it i get it <laughs> uh yeah but if you don't have a mom you might need to save the money. <laughs> I'm just saying there are people like that. Okay, we, we digress. So, the, but the I think the, I get your point though is is that Bitcoin is money, and you guys have made that leap of faith, and uh, you live life accordingly. I think another interesting thing is that you guys are. It seems like you're like you travel, right? Like you're you're you said you're from Canada, but you're living in India. And so when you start shifting time zones and countries, you start to see a little bit that. Uh, you know that bitcoin is actually one it's like it's like the same everywhere and and you yeah. know and uh, whereas like the money and all of a sudden your canadian bank account or your indian bank account it's like you know they take the fees out of it even when the money's in like you know like i've had so many times where you just forgot about a bank account and you owe like 500 dollars or something because you just forgot about it a couple years later but bitcoin is is like it's like really money right um but like from a global you guys have so many different angles like you have the computer scientist version of you you have the global citizen kind of version of you but do you want to speak to that a bit like how it's kind of like money everywhere <laughs> That's, I think we're going to have different opinions on that as mm. well, but Keegan, I'll let you start. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's, my take on this is uh, like one of the first things that you do when you step off the plane is you have to buy the money of the country, right? Like you have to spend money to make your money from your previous country worth something in another country. Mm. You know, you know what I mean? And you have to do this for, for Bitcoin as well. But like, I, I see us living in a hyper Bitcoinized world in the future where, you know, you step off the plane with your Bitcoin and you can just straight up spend it as Bitcoin. Um but so the nuance here is that your money is worth nothing in another country. Like my, if I take my Canadian dollars to Denmark, mm. the value of, I could be a millionaire, but if I don't have a way of making that Canadian dollars be whatever the currency is in Denmark, then the, the value of my bank account is zero. I have no money. <laughs> that <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter how, how much I work. It's kind of funny to think that. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, right. So I, this was a part of a, another discussion that we had like half an hour ago and I forget how this exactly ties in it's just oh yeah it's like what is the value of the money that, that the government gives us to use right it's it's uh, it's effectively zero if I can't use it everywhere um like I want to live in a world that has a universal money like like gold like I actually really like why? gold why, why? Do- yeah um because Every time I have to spend money to convert it into a different form of money, mm. uh, that's a that's a friction point that I don't think needs to exist. It, 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 like trade, the easier it is for me to trade my 
goods or services for someone else's goods or services or trade my goods and services for, for money, the, the faster that human progress can progress, the faster that we can actually, like, I love this quote, it's super relevant. If goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. And the more friction points that we put in between you exchanging goods or services for money, uh, like that, I don't love these sanctions that are happening in Russia. I don't like Russia going and invading Ukraine, but I don't like, I also don't like these sanction, sanctions because of that quote, like we're cutting Russia off of resources. Mm. <laughs> like what, what's a faster way to piss them off? <laughs> what's a faster way to make the entire population of Russia pissed off at the West? Right. Like right now it's Putin and his goonies. But like, what's a faster way to make a whole country angry? Well, make them hungry. <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? Like make it so they don't like McDonald's has left and like banks have been shut down. All the companies like Nike, Adidas, they're all shutting down everything. Um, and it's like, OK, great. Goods are no longer crossing those borders. And eventually they're going to have a massive army of hungry people that will. I mean, that's essentially what I saw history this, tells me. I saw this funny like video of this Russian lady being like, uh, thank you so much for getting rid of McDonald's. Now we can be healthy again. And, yeah. and then she was like, at the same time, so you guys can be healthy. We're going to cut you off from oil so you can walk where you need to go. <laughs> Anyways, you're, you're going to make a counterpoint. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Ruka, I, I just went on a rant here. So you sh you said why? Um, yeah, I did. But like that's that's kind of my reasoning is like mm. the easier that we can do trade with one another. Um, like trade trading money and goods and services is a way better alternative than trading bullets. And uh, mm. I I just that's what I'm more in favor of. I think that trade is gonna survive no matter what money is used because trade is way older than. Bitcoin is and like trade goes as far back as human civilizations expanding. Mm. Um, so I don't think that you necessarily need Bitcoin to trade. Mm. And then the other thing is in all of our travels is so, you know, we started our travels one because we were, we were really sick of being in Canada for two years. We felt shut in and, and <laughs> the travel bug had caught me really bad. So I really wanted to leave. When did you guys, and when did you guys go out there? Or sorry. We start November. We started. Our oh, trip just in, in November. November. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Last year, um, and it was the we decided to go to El Salvador first because we wanted to see. We wanted to be boots on the ground, see what it was like for mm -hmm. people to or a whole country to adopt Bitcoin. So we were there for two and a half weeks, and then because we were there for yeah, yeah. yeah. We okay, sorry, I'm fascinating. Yeah. Okay, and what? How was that like? I'm sorry. I just, I really want to go. My wife's from Colombia. So uh, yeah, the next time yeah. we head down there, we're thinking of making a stopover, but yeah. What's, what's the, what's the deal? How was that? <laughs> it was, I think in a lot of ways. So, uh, you know, when we got off the, the plane, I think the first friction point, as Keegan said, we experienced hmm. was that we, we can't really spend our Bitcoin because we didn't, we weren't hmm. connected to the internet. And then everywhere that we needed to spend like it needed us to be connected to the internet <laughs> just, okay i just make a side point you you brought up tahinis remember at the beginning of this conversation yeah i went to that guy's bitcoin meetup last week he had like 150 people in his restaurant he gave away free food it was like uh, in hamilton which is near where i live it was amazing um why am i bringing it up because now I'm like, I'm looking for tahinis wherever I go. So I found another tahinis. I went, I bought some food. I'm like, do you guys take Bitcoin? They're like, no. <laughs> so the guy's only got it probably going on in his main shop or something. I don't know. But I, I see your point that it's it's like, it's yeah, it, 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 it appears that it's everywhere and it's accepted, but it's definitely not, not yet. That was actually the reality in El Salvador as well, because when we were in the capital city, San Salvador, we mm. were there for about five or six days because the conference was taking place there and the conference ended in El Zante, where we spent a majority of our time. But when we were in El Salvador, sorry, San Salvador, to pay for our taxis, to pay for food, to pay for um, just any, any anything. anything, really. We paid for um, wine with Bitcoin. That was basically it. We did? Yeah, we bought wine. We bought sangria at this little store. Um, in San Salvador? Yeah, on the Lightning Network. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, I did the transaction. Oh, okay. Anyway, but uh, like 95% of everything that we paid for was either with cash or it was with um, with just card. A, a card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we asked people, do you accept Bitcoin? Oh, I remember the sangria now. We asked people if they accept Bitcoin. They just said no. 
And mm. it, it was either because they weren't onboarded properly, they had a really bad experience with the Jiva wallet, or they just didn't want to. So, you know, all of the news that we'd been hearing out of Velsa, coming out of El Salvador, sitting in a different country without actually having any eyes into what how it's happening in, mm-hmm. in the local scenario, mm. we, we were under the impression that when we go there and we land, we're going to be able to pay for everything with Bitcoin. And that was not the case at all. Mm. And more, more than that, I think, I was under the impression that people would care. Like people would care that now they have this alternative <laughs> form of money. People didn't give a shit, right? Like yeah, they just want to get paid so they can go home at the end of the day and buy their groceries and live. Of course, right. Mm. They don't care about how much control um, US But did you go to the Bitcoin with- beach? We went to El Zante <laughs> and even at, so, okay. So okay, when we went to El there, Zante, oh, no. we had, so we actually on our podcast, the Go for Crypto podcast, we recorded our experience in, um, in El Zante, in El Salvador. You, you should check it out and, and be your audience as well, because we very properly documented things as they happened in that um, episode. But, and right now I think it, my memory is a little bit patchy, but even when we were at El Zante, uh, the first three or four days, uh, right after the conference ended, they had this food festival. So there were lots of stalls and there were vendors selling all different kinds of food and fruits and um, for Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and then they had these QR codes printed on this piece of plastic. And then there were some papers as well. And then we were so excited because we are like, okay, cool. Finally, we're at Bitcoin Beach. We're going to be able to pay with Bitcoin um, on the Lightning Network for all of these awesome things that we just kind of want to have the experience of purchasing, not even necessarily interested in eating. But we faced a lot of issues there as well. So the thing with that was, um, I think that there were two separate um, Lightning protocols that were used when they printed it out and i'm not exactly sure again what happened but um you know how you have to create an invoice if you want to get paid in lightning uh you couldn't do that if you just scanned the qr code that they had Mm. and then the other thing was also if it it wasn't like showing up in blue wallet i was using that as my primary method of paying for things there and it just like my blue wallet wouldn't recognize it and later somebody told us that they found a workaround that if you scanned the QR code from your camera or QR code scanner, then it would open up in your browser. Then you could copy what you found in your browser window and then paste that into Blue Wallet and then be able to make that payment. So you need to be a rocket scientist <laughs> in order to pay someone. I, I, it, I, but, yeah, but I can totally <laughs> see how they got there though. I mean, like I said, somebody who builds stuff like this, it's like, but yeah, but that's definitely a drop the ball moment. What's the takeaway? What's the positive thing in this? Is there like an opportunity? Is, is there anything? No, are yeah. we just going to move on to the next uh, topic? No, but, but my, my ultimate question was like, I guess, around given your, well, I have two questions, really, your, uh, which I was going to, the second one I was going to get to is like, just as computer scientists, uh, what is it that you find interesting about Bitcoin, right? Because I don't talk to computer scientists all the time and I like that technical kind of viewpoint. But before that, more as like a global citizen, right? Is like, I guess the kind of the takeaway is, is that it's not nearly as ubiquitous and and perhaps user friendly, usable um, around the world as some may portray. Those are the takeaways. Yeah, yeah. I, in El Salvador, it's on people's lips. I would say that's the positive thing. Like okay. everyone knows the word Bitcoin now. And so like, if you say, do you accept Bitcoin? You're going to get a yes or a no. You're not going to get, well, what's Bitcoin? What is, yeah, that's uh, true. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, right? progress. There we go. Love it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, okay. Again, to maybe I guess dull the blow that I <laughs> made earlier. Yeah. Um, people, once they get past the learning curve, the very, very steep learning curve, um, mm. they would not have a problem with making invoices through their own phone and then showing us the um, the QR code. Or, or you know what, there's point of sale devices too that are in play right now. I'm actually working on some of them um, because if you've, if you've heard of Ellen URL, they have this uh, really cool lightning point of sale system and it accepts you know, on-chain transactions or even lightning transaction, you can create an invoice, very convenient, very cheap um, as well to order or to make and flash. So things are moving in a direction where things are going to get easier for vendors to be able to buy Bitcoin. Oh, sorry, not Bitcoin, um, accept Bitcoin to, to sell Bitcoin. Uh, but I guess, 
to make another blow on that point is since we've traveled um, in Guatemala, it was a um, mostly cash-based economy. We went there for four days. When we went to the UK, everything was contactless. So you could just tap your card and use the Metro or buy food and stuff. But then we had this one really strange and interesting experience where we had to go to Northern Ireland um, for something. And then once we got off the airplane, the bus that took us from the airport to Belfast that they, he only accepted cash, nothing else. Um, you know, at, at this point, we had a phone that was working, like I had internet, but I couldn't tap or we couldn't use our cards. He's like, you got to go to that ATM, withdraw cash and pay me with cash to ride on this bus. And that was the only option, which I was super surprised by because all everywhere in the UK, especially in London, everything was contactless. And then suddenly we have to withdraw cash to pay this bus driver um so that was very interesting and then and here to, sorry, again, to, to me and, and, sorry, go ahead yeah, yeah, yeah please yeah that's the example of why we needed ubiquitous money it's like we spent our time to walk to the atm and to then we had to pay the atm to withdraw the money and it's like think of all the compounding gains that human civilization in general like all of us all over the world would have on a time basis, like think of the time gains that we would have if we didn't have to spend time walking to the ATM because the only kind of money that the uh, that the bus driver takes is is uh, is cash, right? Um, sorry, I just wanted to bring that yeah. back there, but yeah, yeah. go ahead there, Sonny. No, no, I was just gonna make the point around UK banning Bitcoin, Bitcoin, uh, Mining? what's it called? Bitcoin oh, ATMs. ATMs. I don't know if you guys yeah. heard that. That was like. Yeah. That was shocking a bit to me. I don't know. That was kind of scary. Um, but yeah, but that that kind of, I guess, speaks to like how Bitcoin's trying to be that, right? Or like this global money, but but there are obviously, there are Bitcoin's forces in this world trying that to be don't. global money. It's not trying to be global money. <laughs> There's that it's, back too. Bitcoin, Bitcoin is what people make of it, right? There's people hmm. that are trying to make Bitcoin global money. And I'm here, you're there, Sunny. If we wanted to exchange services for money right now, we'd mm. pay you in Bitcoin and if you, you would accept it and then that transaction would be settled. Mm. Um, so Bitcoin is a ubiquitous global money for us because it's so much easier for us to have that transaction via Bitcoin than PayPal or TransferWise or wire transfer, whatever else, right? So it's already a global money for you and I. But like, again, I, I Bitcoin is not trying to be anything bitcoin mm. is what people make of it and i think that i'm um really stubborn about making all of that clear because bitcoin is going to continue to evolve over the years and be different things for different people and it's really important that we emphasize that bitcoin is going to give you the freedom that you are seeking not intrinsically because it possesses it but uh, extrinsically because you're looking for something that can solve your problem and bitcoin does that for you No, I, I see your, I see your point. I see your point. I mean, it's like, it's, I can't argue with that. It's uh, what I'm trying to say is, is like, I, I believe Bitcoin is the only, it's the, it's money. Like we've been arguing, right. Which is, and if it is the form of money, it should be able to solve all these problems. And one of its, in like the things that's holding it back is regulatory things, right. In the sense that they're going to ban it. Like this was literally a question. If they banned it in Europe, for example, what, what was the thing on the table? If that were to occur, Bitcoin wouldn't be useful, right? Because if you were sitting in Europe right now and I was sitting in Canada, we wouldn't be able to transact. Um, no, you still would. Unless you mm -hmm. already had it, but that'll also open up black Yeah, market. but it's just, it's going to get harder, no? It's going to get considerably harder. I think- You can ban something that's useful. You also can't People ban always something find that's a ubiquitous. Way. Like think of the prohibitions that have existed in Western mm -hmm. culture recently, like the marijuana and alcohol prohibition. Mm -hmm. The only thing that those things did was increase demand for both of them and put a premium on them because then like using them comes with a higher risk. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't make anyone not want to smoke weed or drink, uh, drink alcohol. <laughs> it mm -hmm. uh, like those desires of humans didn't go away. It mm -hmm. just made them build systems around using them. Right. So yeah. you, you ban mm. Bitcoin, like you're not, it, it doesn't signal to people, oh, I should listen to my government. Like, no, <laughs> like mm. people are still going to go and try to use the thing. And con conversely, oh. you can legalize Bitcoin like El Salvador and people can still not give a shit. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So it doesn't matter what we do is the point. Just, just go home and watch Simpsons. Uh, okay. So, 
what, what, what about the computer, computer scientist in you? I'm curious, how do you, when you, when that hat was put on and, you know, cause you guys said you both studied that in university. So when you were coming at Bitcoin and kind of like looking at it in terms of other things you've studied and whatnot, like what, what were things that, you know, kind of surprised you or like were, were pleasantly perhaps maybe got you to think like, wow, I didn't even know that was possible, but, but just curious from more, from a technical perspective. This, I think that yeah, go ahead, uh, no, well, I think that uh, we're really blessed um, in that sense because we could actually look into the code base and recognize what was actually happening. And a lot of the times when we're talking about Bitcoin to other people and hosting presentations or workshops, we say, well, Bitcoin is a public ledger. You can look into it and you can also verify it yourself because one question we get a lot is how do you know it's only 21 million? You know, how do you know that no one can go in and change that number? Mm. And for someone who doesn't know how to read code, it's, I guess it's a, it's a plausible question because mm. how do you know? Yeah. But someone who understands technology, understands code, understands how it executes and how decentralization works and how software runs together working together in different parts of the world it's it's a very easy uh, conclusion to get to right like once you under, once we understood that we never doubted it again we didn't have to take anybody's word for it but for someone who doesn't understand computer science they essentially mm. have to take our word for it that oh you know these guys know what they're talking about we trust them so i guess it's only going to be 21 million so as computer scientists i think that some of the technical aspects of bitcoin uh we could um we could come to a conclusion to or trust uh faster and easier because we we just understood it verified faster and verified yeah yeah and for me um i it was uh, arriving at the conclusion that bitcoin essentially does one thing that was a, a big aha moment for me and this is tim Rugakshi's point that like bitcoin doesn't want anything it's not capable of wanting something right it's not it no, I get that. Fun. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, Bitcoin yeah. is just like, it's like, yeah, it's like saying like glass wants something. It's like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. yeah, it's designed. And that brings glass back to the philosophy the question, but we'll get to that. Yeah, 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 go <laughs> ahead. But, I, but, but I, I, that's what I was alluding to with the chancellor thing. And it's like, but there is a person that designed this or group of people with an intent. And they made that intention quite clear, not only in code and the white paper, but in kind of some of the references and a lot of the verbiage afterwards. So I'm curious how that comes back to this, right? That it's, 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 yes, it doesn't have a purpose, but, but doesn't the technology, like, doesn't it, like, didn't, didn't even Vincent Satoshi say that like people who are perhaps libertarian would gravitate towards this sooner than others. And, you know, were, weren't there certain, like, wasn't true. it looking at like Austrian economics as a model, obviously over Keynesian and like, wasn't it making like fundamental I would say philosophical freedom promoting ideas, right? Censorship resistance, decentralization, the open source element. There's all these, I, I feel, I don't know, but anyways, I, but ah, let's go back to your point, Keegan. So you were, you were finishing up something before I get there. So, yeah. I, I actually would love to talk about Satoshi a little bit. In yeah. The that this, this individual or entity may have had for Bitcoin and how Bitcoin's kind of um, diverged from whatever its original intention may have been. Um, just like capping off the computer science angle here mm. for a moment. Like I was, I was on my way to saying that, like, like I arrived at a conclusion that Bitcoin uh, does exactly one thing and, and all it does is keep track of Bitcoin, right? It's a beautiful system. Like when I looked into the Bitcoin code base and when I started to understand how the components are put, put together, it, it like, uh, like for a computer scientist who understands code, it does actually give you the impression that you're listening to a symphony, uh, or like a very, very looking at a very beautiful painting, or, or um, there is a beauty to how it all works together, but it's all to just achieve one thing. And that mm. like Bitcoin does one thing only: it's keep track of Bitcoin, and it does that one job perfectly. It knows where all Bitcoin is at all times, um, and that's replicated everywhere, <laughs> everywhere where there's an instance of Bitcoin, and that that's a really cool thing. Is because we don't actually need anything else from a monetary system. Um, like because this this realization made me realize the issue with fiat money. One of the issues with fiat money is anyone can make new money. Uh, sorry, not anyone. Sorry, only a select group can make new money, and then mm. they can put it anywhere. But with Bitcoin, no one can make new money, or you can only make new money under a certain uh, set of rules, and you have to abide by the rules if you want to put it somewhere else. 
and mm. all the while bitcoin's going to keep track of where that where that is and it's going to do a perfect job at that um and that's that's the computer science angle at a high level um but uh, we can we can go into some, what satoshi had in mind for bitcoin now so yeah okay let's do that um who is satoshi <laughs> No, let's not talk about that. Or do you have any clue or any any guesses? <laughs> I'm not actually curious about yeah. it. I've, I've I've been asked that question. I do you have a different answer? Oh, I I you? there's a compelling case to be made for Len Sassaman. Um I I do you know that name? Have you come across oh, that? Surprised. I was a bit surprised. No, I haven't. I there I've heard a lot of names, but not that one. Uh, Guys, I'm... we should we should point uh you and your audience to the guy swan um article that was read about him and mm. that's that was a truly emotional uh, yeah. episode for keegan and, i cried during the episode because yeah. he ended up taking his life um about a month after satoshi signed off of the internet satoshi left the internet um and then len sassman took his own life um a, about a month after this he was an individual that uh, he was american uh, worked in the uk slash um uh, where's where's the other where's the satoshi statue that bronze statue um, i think it's an um how do you spell his name len what l-e-n sassaman s-a-s-s-a-m-a-n i do believe uh that's where one of my mm. friends is from it's in europe is it oslo or <laughs> mm. no anyway uh, that's where this person worked and uh, he worked with he helped develop BitTorrent. he um, was uh, helped develop he was a cypherpunk uh, he worked alongside Hal Finney he knew Hal Finney he knew and worked with Adam Back at one point in time he studied under the godfather of blockchain I forget what his name is at the moment but in the 1980s like uh, 1982 an individual proposed um, a, the hash chain essentially a blockchain the earliest mention or form of it and mm. he was one of his understudies and so like one of the things about satoshi is like who in the world has networking knowledge and cryptography knowledge and mathematics and economics and philosophy and all of this knowledge combined like the likelihood that it's one person is uh is fairly unlikely and then all these kind of things line up for this one len sassman guy but i don't love giving satoshi an identity i think as soon as mm. we do that we actually risk the integrity of, uh, of bitcoin i think it's really important to not ascribe a gender mm. or a race or an age or mm. anything to, to satoshi i think it's very mm. important for for bitcoin to recognize it for what it is yeah pretty much yeah. interesting now no, i uh, yeah but i'll okay interesting sorry you were gonna say something uh was it lithuania I don't think might have so. been. No, I okay. well, no, I thought I heard something about Lithuania. I, I know the stats so you're talking about, though. Mm. Yeah. So what? But I guess the deeper question you were trying to allude to, I guess, was is like what? What was he, she, it, they? Uh, what was their intention? What was their goal with it? Or did they have a goal? I mean, they must have had a goal, though. Like, I mean, you don't dedicate I... years of your life to building something like this without having a goal. Yeah, to enable peer-to-peer -peer transfer of money. <laughs> I would say that that was the first and foremost, the, the frontline goal. And that's essentially, you know, what the, the subheading is in the white paper too. And the, even on the first page, that one or two paragraphs that is written is a, a really fantastic um, description of what Bitcoin was designed to be. Okay, so you're talking about the what. I agree. The white paper does a beautiful job of that. I, but aren't we talking about the why? Oh, the, like, well, isn't yes. the philosophical or the question? Yeah, so why isn't that? Like, isn't, isn't that what we're trying to get at? Like, I, I get it. I mean, I get the why. I've read the white paper many times. I've, but well, why did they, did he, did she, whatever, why did they create it? I think that that is also in the in the first paragraph, and um, I'd have I would be paraphrasing if I was trying to remember it, but it was essentially that uh, for for years the the one one the one thing that we uh, depend on is third parties to make transactions on our behalf on the internet, and mm. Bitcoin is a solution or a system that does not require 
the assistance and the dependence on these third parties to make those transactions possible. So Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system because for the first time, you can transact globally with anyone anywhere in the world. Um, and, you know, all, and all they would need is I, this wasn't in the in the white paper, but you can essentially transact with anyone anywhere in the world for how much ever you want to send them on this Bitcoin network. And that's what Bitcoin is. And, and to the why, um, regard mm. to, I think you've actually nailed it on the head with your instinctual answer of frustration. Um, and to Sonny's point, like that's what that's what the Genesis block to, says to me. It's like I'm I'm frustrated. I'm really frustrated with the state of the world. This is where we started. Where, like, where are we going to get to, right? Um, who knows? Who knows where this whole thing will lead? But this is where we started. We started at a place of a really dark place, actually, in, in my opinion. And just like the level of corruption that's only continued, actually, in the last 13 years since Bitcoin began. Um, it's only gotten worse, which is, but like Bitcoin is, uh, to me, it's a saving grace. Like, mm. I think the, the, the why is a, uh, like the individual who uses Bitcoin ascribes it the why, um, but the intent or the why at block one for Satoshi feels like frustration to, to me. And what's your why? why? Why are you guys after Bitcoin? Why are you trying to educate people about Bitcoin? Why, why are you on a podcast talking about Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, well, what's your guys' why? Uh, I think that because uh, the way that and this is me thinking out loud, I don't think that I've necessarily given it too much of a thought as to what drives me to do this, but <clears throat> um, what's that word rut, I think is the word like, where, where the average person or the average individual is sort of stuck in this ever, um, or in this loop or in this cycle that they, they can't really catch a break or um, have the time to sit and contemplate what sort of cycle they are living and whether or not they have chosen to live it. Mm. And uh, I think in what I guess my purpose or what drives me with the podcast and creating content and working on side projects and developing this technology is uh, to give people the means to uh, contemplate if it's passively like the podcast you can listen to when you're on your way to work or when you're doing the dishes or when you're carrying through your daily responsibilities. It's the best way to communicate with someone. And um, even if someone doesn't have time to sit and contemplate the things that are taking place in their life and, you know, know what to do about it. I think that with knowledge and with education and with information, they have the ability to make that decision for themselves. And because we have the willpower and the time and the means and the, means and the knowledge to communicate this information, this is why we're doing it. It's extremely rewarding to have people fill our inboxes with, uh, with thank yous as well um like i would i would take a uh, hundred thank yous over a hundred dollars any day um and that's that brings a lot of meaning to to, to what we're doing uh I, i've been thinking about my answer when regashi was giving hers and um saying that we're in a rut to me is an understatement uh, like uh, learning about monetary history it's it's pretty clear to me that we're headed for something pretty painful and uh like i can't I, no matter how much I try to prove myself wrong, uh, the more reading I do just convinces me of that fact even more. And, uh, and that scares me a lot. I'm, I'm an optimistic about the, I'm optimistic about the long term, mm. Um, but mm. in the short term, I'm extremely pessimistic. I think that we're headed for, for, for some very um, profound pain and change in, in the short term. Well, why though? Inflation's only like 8% and Biden <laughs> told me for a fact that it's got nothing to do with the government and it's all because of Putin <laughs> and the truckers maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, propaganda is, is fun. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like living in, uh, oh my goodness, like in, uh, what's it called? Um, like the Twilight Zone or something. <laughs> it's like, it's so yeah. weird. And, like we live in this really funny you know, like multi-universe where some people are like super kind of in this like trance and um oh that reminds me of that movie. Have you seen it pop up on Netflix, Sunny? It's called Don't Look Up. I love that movie. No, I you... haven't. Uh so Leonardo in DiCaprio. An, anyone yeah. listening, if you haven't watched it, then this may be some spoilers for you. So you can skip 
ahead if you want but <laughs> um, that movie did such a good job of demonstrating the way that governments and society work right uh, and the story goes like this there's a scientist that discovers that there is this it was an it's asteroid a comet. A comet okay this comet is headed straight for earth like and its trajectory it's hit. yeah right science um <laughs> but but and then they're like oh my gosh we got to do something about this otherwise life as we know it is going to end like, it, this it, is it this is an apocalyptic level um and yeah they can calculate that it's coming in six months because again science so the story revolves around how these the scientists and uh, these two scientists go to the US government and the US government doesn't take them seriously and they're like oh we're going to get that checked by our state scientists who lie about it or who lie about the science and then the science changes in three months because initially they calculated that it wasn't going to hit earth and then three months later they're like oh yeah actually never mind the, the science that, or the math that these people came up with last time was dead on so you should like we are having a comet headed our way and we are going to die and then this really rich um Com- this this company comes up with a plan to destroy the comet to with, mine the asteroid well no first the comet, yeah. first the plan was to destroy the comet and then they realized oh hang on this comet actually has lots of materials of that course. we can harvest and then use <laughs> to build more things on planet earth so it's like they're on their way to go destroy the comet but then the rocket turns around the rockets turn around and then they land back and everyone's like or the scientists like what are you doing you right, need no more, to no go. more spoilers though. okay like, no anyway so the the thing this is, is that fascinating. this <laughs> this it, movie but, yeah. is is full of truths, very uncomfortable truths, and the reason why it's called "Don't Look Up" is because there's propaganda um, uh, by the government saying "Don't look up, don't look up." The comment isn't coming, uh, and there's these rallies, and there's like a new election period starting, so they have the slogans "Don't, don't look, look up." up. Don't, don't look, look up. up and the, the movie yeah anyway so i i eventually, won't yeah, it, it's hard to figure out what is the truth coming. what's that what's that eventually someone looks up and, at hmm. this rally ironically enough. Sees, oh yeah it is Wait, coming actually. yeah like <laughs> okay I, we've got a week now <laughs> so uh, all of this coming back to the whole conversation about uh you know how, how why are we headed for this painful revelation of something and um, it's you know like you said um it's only transitory or it's not now anymore and we should definitely blame the war for all of these prices hiking up and it's not our fault and we only did this to protect you all of this is a way to deflect what's actually happening beneath the this layer of mush and lies and that's what we need to tear apart and bring to the public as best we can as soon we can and again you know someone can listen to this and say what do these guys know they're not economists they're not they're like they're computer scientists all they understand is code um and to that i I would respond i think it was a couple of months ago and the economist had this Pub, this article published that infl- inflation at an all-time high uh, at five point whatever percent no economist saw this coming and literally hmm. for the past two years all that we have been worried about and talking about is inflation of our money because of the amount of money that entered circulation so anyone that can do algebra and simple math knows that inflation is a result of, uh, of, of a circulating supply. And them saying that no economist saw this coming was, you know, another another check to that, uh, that list of things of not to believe in propaganda because, yeah, I, I don't know how to finish this, but it's very No economists may have seen this coming, but but we did. Uh, yeah, and we're not economists. Have. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, math so is a funny thing. No, you can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't trick it. That's the beauty of. I mean, that's what I find beautiful about Bitcoin is that it's just so elegant and so simple, and it just is. You know, um, it doesn't know how to tell a lie. Yeah, it, it can only tell truths. What and in all, uh, oh, what I do know is, is on a personal note, before I discovered Bitcoin, I like you said, thought the world was a very, very dark place because the more you read about like the federal reserve and money printing and you know just kind of how the world is you start to um realize that yeah it's it, the cards are stacked against all of us i used to be even at one point a uh, i'll use air quotes a financial advisor <laughs> i sat across i don't know i want to say hundreds maybe thousands of families and it was just like utter confusion and and i remember for me it was like 
I had all these like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm an electrical engineer, but like I had all taken all these classes and courses to learn about finance. And here I was advising people. And if somebody would have asked me back then, like, what is money? I would not have been able to even answer them. Like I knew inflation was this bad thing and you have to put your money in stocks and other things and, you know, mutual funds and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, these things that pretty charts 10% every year, it'll go up. Well, why? Just because it has in the past. Yeah. Just, you know, just believe it, please. <laughs> like the, the entire thing kind of depends on it. Uh, it was, it was just hilarious, but then like discovering Bitcoin and was just like, ugh. Um, but I, I think ultimately though, why I love Bitcoin is that it gives me, the one thing that I can't get from anywhere else, which is time, right? Yeah. It gives me time to meditate, to read books, to spend time with my two little ones, to, I don't know, go to the gym, like just to do shit that I like, right? And, and there's nothing else that I've discovered in my life that that gives you back time. And, and like, it not only gives it back to you, it like starts to amplify it for the longer you hold and gives you the ability to, you know, help others. And I think it's, it's just a beautiful thing. It's, uh, um, but yeah, but what else, what else is there guys? I mean, we've kind of gone on a lot of different tangents i know thanks for being kind of patient with all the different twists and turns we, i've already oh, we've, we've gone like quite a bit here but i i'd love to hear you know i don't know any other any i mean i'd love to do a follow-up uh i mean it sounds like i mean you guys could go a lot of different ways with uh, your show as well but like you know in terms of like the bitcoin angle as well you know that's something that i'm always looking to kind of go deeper into and and so if you guys want to do i don't know where we maybe do like a, a white white paper uh showing or something where we talk about it and like go go like read a paragraph and then jam about it or something for like 15 minutes and you know stuff like that i, I would be totally totally down because um you know it's uh, it's rare that you get like people that are technical that also kind of are like fully into it and you know want to are willing to talk about it um but yeah no this has been excellent guys and i and i think you know it's uh anything else you guys want to share with i don't know with with my mini audience we're gonna start by the way like a lot of my shows uh, i'm gonna start kind of um populating it through uno coin as well and kind of writing blogs about it right now it just lives on my youtube channel and so it doesn't get a lot of love but the goal is to kind of you know give it some life but uh but but where where can i don't know like what anything else you guys want to talk about first of all on the bitcoin side of things in terms of you know monetary policy i think we touched on philosophy the technical side of it you know how it brushes up against governments and propaganda we talked about trucker convoys lots of things but anything you guys want to maybe bring up i mean i brought up a bunch of things on my side here but yeah yeah well i guess to end um i want to say this one thing and it, i saw this in brad's story again it was posted by the new york times i think it was an opinion piece and mm -hmm. the headline was that thinking critically may not be as effective as you think it is and the article was about how you're not supposed to think critically about things because that actually harms you and uh <laughs> or, or freedom how like the word freedom is quickly becoming associated with like something with right really bad or like yeah. the canadian flag for that matter right it's like it is straight up twilight zone like <laughs> so uh, i think yeah. that to that if to that note i'd like to say that mm. just you know if you think that you're already awake then maybe shake pinch yourself a little bit look around you know take stock of what you think you own and then make note of what you actually own and look into the future of five years, 10 years. If you have a family, even to safeguard yourself, you need to be prepared because when black swan events happen, you don't have time to prepare at the very last minute. Right now is your time. Do it now. Start waking up now. Yeah, sure. No matter what anybody mm. says, continue to think critically about everything, even the things that we're saying, never stop thinking critically. Yeah, yeah, no, well said. Think critically, um, think logically. Um, and then like, you know, like lead with love, I would say, right? Because I don't know, in my experience, yeah. whether it's like the trucker convoy or Bitcoin, um, like us geeky people right like engineer types like for us logic can sometimes get us to the promised land but for for most other people it's like it's got nothing to do with that like they, they it's almost a turnoff right and so i feel like 
like, I don't know, for me, Bitcoin, again, like you said, Bitcoin just is, right? Like, doesn't, it's not trying to do anything. But for me, Bitcoin represents freedom. It represents love because I can spend more time with my kids. I can spend more time with my wife. It's just like, it's like the best ever. I can spend more time with my parents and do things that I love and build businesses and, you know, and help more people. And so I'm really, really grateful for Satoshi. <laughs> um, what about yourself? Do you, do you, you want to close this off on a couple of notes here or... Uh, I don't think so. I think you guys did a pretty good job. Um, mm. So we'll just have to come back some other time and uh, and cool. we'll begin a whole new conversation. It'll be about Austrian economics after I finish. I would love, me. yeah. We we can do like a about, like a Robert cool. Breedlove ten part episode type of thing. Just just the three of us talk. I feel like we could talk about a lot of different things. This is cool. I really enjoyed it, guys. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope uh, I hope our listeners enjoyed this. Yeah, I think this uh, this is really this is really interesting. Cool, guys. Sure. Okay, Thanks I'm so gonna... much for having us on, Sunny. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so I'm going to bring this one to a close.